Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School for February 21st, Sunday, February 21st. We are still in Unit 3, which is entitled The Call of Women. We're in Lesson 12. And from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly, our lesson title is Risk Takers. Risk Takers. Our devotional reading is taken from Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 to 15. Our background scripture is taken from Acts chapter 18, verses 1 to 26. Romans chapter 16, verses 3 and 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19. And 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 19. Our printed Our lesson passage is taken from Acts chapter 18, verses 1 to 3, verses 18 to 21, verses 26, I'm sorry, 24 to 26, and Romans chapter 16, verses 3 and 4. Our key verse is Romans chapter 16 verses 3 and 4, which read from the King James Version, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Again, that's Romans chapter 16, verses 3 and 4. Less names from the quarterly, or number 1, Research the lives and ministry of Priscilla and her husband, Aquila. Number two, appreciate the ministry of those who explain the way of God with accuracy. And then number three, seek opportunities to use your gifts or abilities to further the gospel. The lesson has three major divisions after the introduction. The first is entitled Similar in Trade. That's covered between Acts chapter 18, verses 1 to 3, and verse 18. The second is Similar in Task. That's covered between Acts chapter 18, verses 19 to 21, and 24 to 26. And the third is Salute of Thanks. That's covered between Romans chapter 16 verses 3 and 4. From the standard commentary, our lesson title is Call to Explain. Call to Explain. And very quickly, additional aims are, number one, list several facts about Priscilla and Aquila. Number two, explain the importance of the ministry of Priscilla and Aquila in relation to Paul. Then number three, write a note of appreciation to a ministry partner. Okay, we are <clears throat> going to give just a little background on the lesson. We have uh, several uh, verses uh, that at uh, first glance seem to be a bit disjointed, but we see a common thread uh, through at least our lesson text, which is <clears throat> the couple, Asil- Priscilla and Aquila, or Aquila and Priscilla. <laughs> And uh, we're going to uh, examine uh, the, the lives of this couple this, uh, that was devoted to the gospel and, uh, and aiding, of course, Paul in the gospel ministry. Uh, and um, we're also going to see how uh, Paul, how rather God used them and Paul commended them. As we go through this lesson. Now, uh, as we go through the lesson, let's remember our unit uh, title, which is the call of women. So we want to uh, pay particular attention to the fact that Priscilla has a an equal role in the ministry of the couple that uh, both Aquila and Priscilla had. Uh, and and uh, she is uh, mentioned every time Aquila is, which gives her equal standing in her ministry in the gospel. 
So let's offer a brief word of prayer and we'll give a little background and jump into our lesson. Father, we do thank and praise you for yet another opportunity to study your precious word. Lord, we thank you for blessing us in so many seen and unseen ways, Lord, always for your loving kindness and your tender mercies. Lord, we pray that you would uh, give us a clear understanding of this lesson, Lord. Uh, the example that we can uh, see in this lesson as to how we are to partner, Lord, in ministry uh, and and to uh, utilize the synergy, Lord, that you've given us uh, as individual Christians uh, to com uh, when combined with others, Lord, to be more effective in our ministry of the gospel, Lord. We thank you for this great example that you've given us. And Lord, we thank you for um, understanding um, uh, what our needs are, Lord, whatever they are. And we uh, we know that there's all kinds of things going on in this world, not to mention, not the least of which rather is the pandemic, which uh, is still raging and it's affected uh, so many lives in so many ways, Lord. We just pray that you'd help us to remember that you are still in control and to have peace, Lord a peace that surpasses the understanding of this world as we trust in you, Lord. You told us to be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving to make our requests made known unto you and the peace of God which passes understanding will keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So we just ask your blessings upon all according to their needs, Lord. And again, increase our understanding of your word. And as you do, Lord, increase our faith and our obedience to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, our lesson begins um, in Acts chapter 18, uh, first passage, uh, verses 1 to 3. Uh, and uh, we know that Paul has been uh, ministering in Athens. Uh, we read uh, Acts chapter 17. He uh, actually... Uh, shared the gospel on Mars Hill, or, uh, which was uh, just below the Acropolis in Athens. My wife and I have had to, uh, been blessed to have been there on that hill. And uh, he, uh, his message was received by some, uh, rejected by others, and others just simply says, hey, we'll just uh, hear you again uh, on some other at some other time, uh, the Athenians uh, were very curious uh, people, and they, they they wanted to hear some new thing, some new strange thing, some some secret. And of course, they regarded uh, some of them regarded what Paul had shared as mere superstition, but some. Uh, did believe, and that verse 34 tells us, let's just back up to 32, and it says, and when they had heard uh, of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed among them Dionysus and, Are and Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So some believed in the message of the gospel, the Christ, of Christ, rather. Now, we're going to read the passage uh, covered by our first division in the quarterly, which, again, is entitled Similar in Trade. Similar in trade. I'm going to read from the King James Version. And, and it reads, After these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought for their occupation, for by their occupation, rather, they were tent makers. Skipping down to verse 18, and it says, And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, 
and then took his leave from the brethren and sailed thence into Syria. And with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shone his head in Sincrea, for he had a vow. Okay, he had a vow. Now we're going to back up to verse 1, verse 8, chapter 18. And again, uh, let's just let's break this verse down. It, it says, part A says, after these things, Paul departed from Athens. And we just read what those things were in verses 32 to 34 of chapter 17. After some, uh, when they heard of the resurrection, they mocked. And some said, we'll hear him again. And then others believed. After those things, Paul departed from Athens to Corinth, about 50 miles west. And uh, it was uh, the seat of the Roman government in this area. Now, Corinth is actually part of Greece, but it was the seat of the Roman government in that area. And it was the residence of the deputy Gallio. And we read about him in Acts chapter 18, verse 12. We'll talk more about him in a minute. So, Corinth was part of Greece, and it was a, uh, a, it was a commercial center. It was a commercial hub. And it was uh, an isthmus, which um, was a narrow uh, stretch of land between two seas uh, that was only four miles wide. And uh, uh, so it it was it was possible, and they actually did transport ships over land uh, between the two uh, seas, uh, so that they didn't have to go around the Pe uh, Peloponnesian Peninsula, which would have taken these ships hundreds of miles out of the way in dangerous seas. So they had kind of jury rig, or not jury rig, but constructed kind of a a ship railroad that carried ships the four miles from one uh, sea to the other. So it was a, uh, as I said, a commercial center and a, a, a center of uh, trade, one of the primary way stations in that, in that part of the Roman Empire, the eastern part of the Roman Empire. And it was a religious uh, city, very religious. Uh, however, many pagans, uh, there were many pagan beliefs there. Uh, and, of course, there were some uh, Jews as well, and some actually uh, followers of Jesus Christ, namely um, Aquila and Priscilla. So part uh, B says, and came to Corinth, Part uh, verse 2, A says, And found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Now, uh, Aquila is a Latin name, which means eagle. And despite that, he was a Jew. He was Jewish, and uh, he originally hailed from uh, Greek region on the south shore of the Black Sea known as Pontus, and that was an area where uh, there were many Jewish merchants, and Aquila had uh, made his way to Italy at some point. In fact, I uh, certainly believe that he and his wife were actually in Rome, uh, and they were expelled from Rome. Uh, we'll explain why in just a minute, but it mentions his, his wife Priscilla, and that name uh, is an affectionate nickname for a woman named Prisca. Prisca. Uh, and uh, she, no doubt, was of a Jewish family as well. However, we're not told that for sure. And again, uh, we believe that they both uh, had come from Rome. Part B says, because that Claudius, Claudius, the Emperor Claudius, had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. So, uh, now Claudius, uh, uh, during his reign, 
there were uh, Jewish, there were Christians of Jewish backgrounds and Christians, traditional Jewish Jews, I should say, in Rome, and there was conflict between them. Uh, and if you follow Paul's ministry, you know that every place he went, it appears that he created conflict uh, with his Christian doctrine uh, with the traditional Jews. And so there was conflict in Rome, and rather than Claudius trying to figure out what was going on between them, he just expelled them all. Uh, that's the, that's the, the, the theory, at least. Verse 3 says, and because, and this was, uh, by the way, uh, this was around 49 AD, uh, after Claudius' death in 54 AD, uh, Jews were permitted to return to Rome. And we know that ultimately Aquila and Priscilla do return to Rome. Uh, verse 3 says, and because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought for by their occupation they were tent makers. Let's so read that in the NIV for a little greater clarity. And because he was a tent maker, as were as they were, he stayed and worked with them. So that was a uh, <clears throat> a very um, uh, useful and lucrative craft that uh, they there were many uh, uh, tents or tents were in demand I should say and so they could make a fair living making tents and, and even though we know that Paul was uh, trained to be a rabbi at the feet of Camaleo uh, all such trainees were also required to have a trade or a craft that they could actually use a carpentry or baking or some type of professional skill. And uh, Paul uh, was again by trade a tent maker. And uh, that was, it was hard, arduous work. They used, uh, of course, heavy materials, leathers and goat hair and so forth. And so that was, uh, it was hard work, but as I said, it was, <clears throat> it was a decent, it made a decent living, afforded them a decent living. So Paul, first of all, <clears throat> uh, most likely associated with them because of their Christianity, their, their belief in Jesus Christ, but also saw uh, a greater fellowship and an opportunity to, uh, experience, if you will, some synergy by joining uh, in them professionally. So uh, it appears that Paul lodged with them and worked with them, and it probably wouldn't have been uncommon in those days for um, them to have some, uh, to actually do selling at where they live, to actually sell the tents. Uh, and um, this this worked out uh, pretty well in that uh, they were able to uh, probably increase their productivity by working together uh, in uh, this vocation. And as I said, the, the rabbis were all trained to be bivocational. Uh, and it appears that Priscilla and Aquila were bivocational as well. They they actually had a ministry uh, of preaching or teaching the gospel, witnessing, evangelizing, but also uh, in the tent making as well. And um, we know that later Paul <clears throat> uh, tells uh, uh, the Corinthians that he worked with his own hands to earn his own living so that he would not be a burden to them. Uh, I want to say something about this this couple before we get much further along here. Something mentioned in the introduction of the standard. Um, you know, we often hear the term uh, today, power couple. And we uh, understand what that means. Uh, we, 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 we think uh, maybe uh, uh, of someone like... Uh, today, uh, Beyonce and Jay-Z, 
and uh, and it suggests something uh, that uh, I just want to I just want to make mention of here. In fact, it's probably going to be easier for me to just read it from the introduction. It's talking about a couple that uh, work together toward a common goal, uh, usually married. And it says, although conflict can arise in such unions, part of their power is found in common purpose. They often work together toward artistic growth, social change, or economic gain, etc. Their shared goal is not a compromise. They both believe wholeheartedly in the worthiness of their prize and work cooperatively to attain it. When that shared vision is lost, the power couple falters and often uh, the bond between the two dissolves. Lasting and happy power couples complement each other. The strength of one fills the weakness of the other and vice versa. Although they may have differing roles, either partner is considered, uh, neither partner rather is considered superior or more valuable than than the other. The sum of the parts are greater than what each would be individually. And so it was with the power couple that we are talking about today. Aquila and Priscilla, or Priscilla and Aquila. So between verses 3 of chapter 18 and verse 18, where our lesson text picks up, we learn that Paul, as is his habit, he goes into the synagogue in Corinth, and they most likely had a large synagogue there, a lot of Jews. And he, it says, verse 4, and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Uh, and he talks about uh, Silas and Timothy uh, coming from Macedonia. Uh, and it, it goes on to talk about how uh, the Lord spoke. If we skip down to verse 9, the Lord spoke to Paul in a night vision and told him not to be afraid, but to speak and not keep silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. And then it goes on in verse 12 to talk about when Galileo, or Gallio rather, the proconsular, consul rather, of Achaia, uh, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to judge to the judgment seat, saying, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And we could go on, but Gal- Galio says, hey, if this was something to do with uh, some uh, some wrongdoing or some wicked crime, I, I would hear you, but this has to do with, with your religion, and you go deal with that yourself. And he drave them from the judgment seat. And we see that they took uh, the, in verse 17 says, they and the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. So uh, they basically were rebelling against the teaching of Paul in the synagogue. And we have to believe that Aquila and Priscilla were supporting him. They were part of his ministry. And uh, even though Paul did not suffer harm uh, at this point. We see the leader of the synagogue was beaten. So then we pick up at verse 18, and 18 reads, uh, let's look at part A, it says, and Paul after this, that's after all that I just mentioned there, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave from the brethren, and sailed thence to Syria, And with him, Priscilla and Aquila. So they had really formed uh, a bond uh, and a partnership in the ministry. So much so that Priscilla and Aquila uproot uh, their business uh, in Corinth. And they decide to become missionaries with Paul. Part B says... Uh, having shone his head in Sancria, for he had 
a vowel. Let's read that from the, the NIV. In fact, let's read all of 18 from the NIV. It reads, Paul stayed in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Sincrea because of a vow he had taken. Now, there's a little confusion about uh, this vow, depending on which commentator you read. Uh, uh, some think that he shaved his head in making a vow. Uh, others think that he has taken a Nazarite vow, which could be temporary or for life. We know both uh, uh, John the Baptist uh, uh, and Elijah were Nazarites for life. Samson, I should say. Samson was to be a Nazarite for life. And John the Baptist. Uh, the, uh, However, uh, it was allowed to take a temporary Nazarite vow where, where you would not cut your head and you would abstain from uh, from wine and, and uh, touching corpses and so forth and so on uh, for a period. <clears throat> and, um, and one commentator thinks that Paul did that, took a Nazarite vow uh, in thanking God for deliverance in Corinth uh, from this uh, uh, the accusations that were made and the attempt to get him to have him judged by Gallio. I'm not. We're not sure why he made the vow. The Bible doesn't tell us that, and we don't have to improvise anything. But suffice it to say, he took a vow. Uh, the only question is, was the vow made? Uh, was it affirmed by cutting the hair, or was it affirmed by letting the hair grow? And at the conclusion of the vow, the period the Nazarite vow was in place. He cut his hair. That was customary. And it was customary also to deliver that hair to the temple at Jerusalem within 30 days. So I kind of tend to believe that that's the vow he took. He actually had was completing a vow before he took the trip. He cut his, he cut his hair, shaved his head, and he took the hair. And we see, we're going to see later how he must get to the feast at Jerusalem. And we believe that was the Passover feast. By the way, you can read about the Nazarite vow in Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 to 21. Let's move on. Um, <clears throat> verse 19. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Ephesus means desirable, and uh, it was located on the southwest coast of present-day Turkey, and it was the capital city uh, of the Roman province in Asia Minor, and the third largest city in the Roman Empire. And uh, when Paul arrived, it was it had a large Jewish population and a well-established synagogue. If you remember Acts 19, we know that Paul actually set off a riot uh, in Ephesus uh, that was really uh, because the silversmiths were complaining that he had come to destroy their crafts in making uh, these images of Diana, which uh, were idols, obviously, and uh, they, they had a really good trade in doing that but Paul was speaking against idols of course uh, we can and he was there uh, during his third missionary journey for about three years and he, and the church of Ephesus was one of the seven to receive the special message from Christ in revelations 2 1 to 7 we remember that so Paul uh, goes uh, as he as was his custom I said as soon as he hit the ground in the city he goes to the synagogue and uh, and he begins to reason with the Jews. What do you think he was reasoning about? He was using Old Testament scriptures, which they were familiar with, and showing them Christ in the Old Testament scriptures, how he must suffer, how he must die to bear the sins of, uh, 
of the world. He no doubt uh, shared Isaiah 53 with him and many, many others. Let's look at verses 20 and 21. When they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep the feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. Now, uh, he had a better reception, initial reception, it appears, in Ephesus than he did in Corinth, beside the riots, of course, with believers, with actually the Jews, uh, uh, the traditional Jews that believed and were converted to Christianity because they asked him to stay, they asked him to tarry. And uh, he said he would not because he had to keep the feast at Jerusalem. Again, don't know whether that was to deliver the hair. But obviously, he recognized that this feast, which we believe was the Passover, was a tremendous opportunity to to share the gospel with the thousands, the many thousands that would be at Jerusalem for the feast. Uh, but he leaves uh, Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus, and he tells them, if God wills, he will return. And we know that uh, that God did will uh, we look at Acts chapter 19 again, verse 1, Paul does return uh, to Ephesus. Verse 21, 24, rather, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in Scripture, came to Ephesus. And by the way, I'm sorry, we are now discussing the Similar tasks, the division of the quarterly that's entitled Similar Tasks, and that's covered between Acts chapter 18, 19 to 21, and 24 to 26. So, um, while Ephesus again had a large Jewish population, uh, Alexandria, Egypt, was really the world center of Greek thinking, Hellenistic uh, and Judaic Judaism, uh, or the Hellenistic or Greek Jews, actually. Uh, many were from Alexandria. In fact, the Septuagint, which is the Greek Old Testament, was translated in Alexandria. And that city had a reputation as a center of knowledge. And Apollo was probably very well educated uh, in a in the systematic interpretation of the scripture using uh, perhaps some teaching methods drawn from Greek philosophers, but he was very eloquent in his speech. He was educated, as we said, and very well versed, we're sure, in the Old Testament, okay? And certainly in the Old Testament and also in John's teaching, uh, we know uh, John the Baptist taught about the coming of the Messiah and the baptism for repentance in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. Verse 25 says, This man was instructed in the ways, in the way rather, of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. Now, um, a little, there's a little confusion on, on this verse, too. And I shouldn't say confusion. A little slight disagreement between commentators um, uh, regarding this verse. Uh, some believe that he uh, knew of the Lord Jesus Christ and... Uh, spoke diligently of those things, uh, but others, John MacArthur, for example, uh, thinks that this does not, did not include the Christian faith. Uh, he did not have a full understanding of the Christian faith. He may have believed that Jesus um, uh, was the Messiah. That's kind of doubtful uh, because he may have had the same common misunderstanding of the Messiah's mission, uh, first mission at least, as, as most of the Jews did. 
but he did understand that uh, perhaps that there needed to be preparation for the coming of the Messiah, and that was uh, what John taught: repentance, uh, repent because the, the, because the Messiah is coming, uh, and he is going to come and baptize with fire. Okay, uh, now he didn't also understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit, so there were there were things about. Uh, the the first uh, advent of Christ, him coming to die, to actually die. He probably didn't really understand the meaning of the resurrection, that he died for our uh, for our justification. Uh, he died for our our sins, and rose for our justification, and. Uh, ascended to heaven, sending the Holy Spirit to indwell believers and to empower believers and to guide believers. Uh, and so he did not understand the full gospel. He understood the Old Testament, no doubt, and he understood the the laws and, and applying how to apply the laws to godly living. That is what some believe that is meant by he understood the ways of the Lord. And that baptism uh, that John taught of repentance was also a ritual cleansing as well, uh, again, uh, and it was based on repentance. It was actually a, uh, a symbolic uh, way of showing that you were repenting, that you were uh, washing off the old sins and having a change of heart and mind toward God, okay? Now, uh and no doubt he did not know what happened at Pentecost again, the coming of the Holy Spirit to indwell all believers. Let's move on to verse 26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took, uh, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Let's read that from the NIV. Verse 26 says, He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. Now, so they understood the full gospel, if you will. They understood the meaning of the death, resurrection of the Lord, and of course the him sending the Holy Spirit to indwell all believers in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so rather than uh, interrupt him uh, while he was speaking with great passion at the synagogue, which some might have done, some crass people might have been anxious to show that they knew more than he did uh, and uh, tried to correct him as he was sharing passionately again in the synagogue his understanding out of his understanding uh but they uh, the the text suggests that they pulled him aside uh secretly and they invited him to uh their home perhaps for for a meal and then they explained the way of uh Christ the the gospel uh more fully to Apollos, and we know that he received that. If we we go on to look at uh, Acts chapter twenty eight, uh, in fact, let's uh, let's jump down there for a minute. Let me just let me just go on and very quickly read twenty seven and twenty eight, and it says so. After they had explained uh, the the way of God more accurately to him, as the New King James Version reads as well, verse twenty seven says, and when he desired to cross the Achaia to Achaia. The brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scripture that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus was the, the long-awaited Messiah. If he did not understand that fully before, he understands it now. And he's able to share from the Old Testament what they understood, what they knew, uh, uh, enough to, to convince them, I'm sure, that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah. So the, the fact that uh, Aquila and Priscilla uh, were 
uh, approached again um, Apollos, you know, secretly uh, showed some spiritual maturity on their part. Uh, they they were not looking to get any um, kind of credit or accolades or a comma, you know a commendation for for uh, their knowledge of what they knew. They saw a man that was on fire for the Lord. They could add to uh, the effectiveness of his ministry and this fuller understanding of of what he was sharing. They did, and uh, and 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 God bless them for that. Would to God we had more people like that that work behind the scenes to bolster the ministries of others. I believe that's what the Lord calls us to do. You know, we know that uh, one plants, another waters, uh, but God gives the increase. You know, we're not, we don't have to all do it. Uh, our, we don't have to do it all ourselves. Uh, let's move on now. So we're going to move into our third and final division uh, from the, the quarterly which is entitled Salute of Thanks. Salute of Thanks, and that's taken from Romans chapter 16, verses 3 and 4, which reads, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Let's read that from the NIV. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ. They risked their own lives. Laying down their necks was uh, uh, a suggestion that they would lay, put their head on the block for someone to be, to be beheaded. They risked their, their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Now, the church at Corinth was probably primarily Gentile. The church at Ephesus was primarily uh, Gentile, most likely. Uh, they also had uh, uh, intervened, uh, it appears, for Paul uh, when he was about to be judged by uh, uh, Gallio. Uh, they prevented him from coming into the stadium at Ephesus when the silversmiths had caused a riot. He probably would have been killed then. So they, they had... And in doing so, uh, they associated themselves with him, which put their lives at risk. So Paul is, he's recommending them now to the church at Rome. Remember, the Romans had been expelled. I'm sorry, the Christians had been expelled, all the Jews, rather. Jewish Christians and traditional Jews had been expelled from Rome in 49 AD, but they have been allowed back. They were allowed back in 54 AD. And so Aquila and Priscilla are going back to Rome, and Paul is commending them now to the church that's there now, prob probably uh, in large part Gentiles, certainly some Jews as well. And he is heartily recommending them. And, and with the recommendation from Paul, uh, uh, I'm sure that recommendation went a long way uh, to cause the church at Rome to receive uh, this couple graciously and allow them into uh, their fellowship. Now, from the quarterly, the commentator writes, uh, Paul notes of both Priscilla and Aquila's helpfulness indicated that women were regarded as beneficial to the ministry and work of Jesus Christ in the early church. Paul sent additional salutes regarding Priscilla and Aquila to the church in Corinthians, we can see that in uh, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 19, and to the young minister, Timothy, we see that in 2 Timothy 4, 19. Paul was uh, very uh, blessed by uh, his association with this power couple. Uh, they were very fervent in their, in their faith and their, uh, in their uh, commitment to advancing the gospel and evangelizing uh they were teachers uh and they were they they actually worked behind the scenes with wisdom not looking for any credit uh for themselves and they ministered to Paul and helped Paul perhaps in more ways than we can imagine and so we want to uh, uh we want to just remember as we as we conclude here 
that we we don't have to be long rangers in our our ministry uh, of the gospel. In fact, we can we can more than double our effectiveness uh, many times when we partner with others. And uh, and certainly, um, uh, a husband and wife uh, partner team can be powerful in so many ways. Can set such a a beautiful example of uh, how uh, God intends for uh, us to work together in advancing, again, the gospel, but in partnership in every level of life, in every area of life. Uh, and finally, the, uh, the standard commentator concludes by saying, whether single like Paul or part of a couple like Priscilla and Aquila, all God's people have responsibilities to one another. We must hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering and consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. And that's from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 and 24. So we pray that we have gotten a little better understanding of the effectiveness uh, of the power couple Aquila and Priscilla and Priscilla uh, in advancing the gospel in the early church and the great assistance they provided Paul. We know Paul gets a lot of credit having written some 13 of the uh, epistles, uh, but he had help. He had a lot of help. He mentions many of them. Uh, this couple he mentions prominently because they were uh, uh, partners again with him and they uh, we're very effective in that partnership. So until we, until such time as we meet again, we pray that God will continue to bless you.